All things office tech, leadership, company culture, and fun. This is Fisher's Technology. Hi, and welcome back to our leadership development series. Uh, the new topic, the new category for this session is leadership tools. And we use this basically as a catch-all for some tools. We collect tools from all over the place, leadership tools, little models that we can use in various situations. So there's not really a categorical consistency of these tools, but it's a catch-all of a few tools that we've found useful here at Fishers. The first tool I've titled, well, this is in the tool, tool title, but I, the question is, what are you good and bad at? So this is all about individual development at Fishers um, and how we can develop skills. And so what we leveraged is the conscious competence model. And this is used for lots of different, uh, lots of different things. Um, what I like to use it for Fishers is to understand uh, our own personal development. What do we want to work on individually in our own skill set? So this is the conscious competence model, at least how, how we view it. And what this looks at is what are, what are we good at as individuals or even as an organization? And what are we bad at? And then what do we know about and what do we not know about? So if you look at this quadrant, this is something that we're good at, we're highly competent at, and we know it, right? We're consciously competent. We know we're good at this, again, as individual as a company. Uh, this category is something we're good at, but we don't necessarily know it, an unconscious competence. And this could be, um, you know, you just really make me feel good, or uh, you explain complex concepts in very down-to-earth terms, or something that maybe we're good at, but until someone tells us, we're, we're not conscious about it. This category is something we're consciously incompetent, so we're bad at it, and we know it, right? And this is something that we are unconsciously incompetent, so this is something we're bad at, and we don't know it, right? So these are various skills, behaviors, attributes that, uh, that we have. Uh, the value and, and how we, we explain this and use this at Fishers is we want to move things from the unconscious side to the conscious side. Specifically, incompetence. That's where the value is. Um, so if this is something I'm bad at and I don't know it, someone brings it to my attention, now I'm consciously incompetent. Then I can choose to work on it, right? So um, what, what it takes to receive this information from somebody, and we talk about this as values and culture, um, to, to receive for somebody to tell me, hey, Chris, you know, you're bad at this. Well, I have to be curious, right? That curiosity, that open-mindedness, we call it the beginner's mind at Fishers, to receive that information. For s to someone to tell you you're bad at something, that's not usually well-received. We want to receive that well and say, hey, problems are opportunities. I want to know this. I want to learn from it. Trust that the person delivering that information to me has my best intent, had my best interest in mind, and they have their best intentions. Receive that message as a gift. I'm about to receive a gift to learn that I'm bad at something. That takes curiosity, to open-mindedness, um, and it's it's a reason that we want to have regular performance reviews and regular discussions about what's going well, what's not going well. Right. So that moves things from the unconscious to the conscious both good and bad, competence and incompetence. The real value here, though, is, is when someone tells me, Chris, you know you're bad at this, or Fishers is bad at this, we've moved it into this conscious incompetence model, or quadrant. Then we can decide, all right, here's something we're not good at. Do we want to get good at it? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe I'm OK being bad at this. I can't be good at everything. But I can select things to say, you know, I'm bad at this, or Fishers is bad at this, and it's important to get good at it. And then I can move it up into this quadrant and become consciously competent at something, right? And so that's, again, that's an opportunity, regular performance reviews to say, hey, we identified these areas of weakness or areas for improvement. We said, hey, you're going to work on this for the next few months. Let's see how we're doing. Get that regular feedback on have we moved it up into the competent area. Um, we can set goals. What does it look like to be good in this area? And are we achieving those goals? We can engage in professional development and personal development and mentoring. For those things that we identify that we're incompetent at, these things we want to get competent at and engage in that process of, of development of our team and our employees at Fishers. So it's very important to us, uh, culturally at Fishers, to work on these two arrows. Uh, again, if it, it brings the walls down and say, you know, Chris, you're bad at this. Normally, you'd have a, a wall that would come up, defensiveness, and not want to hear that. Say, hey, you know what, that's a really good thing. That's a gift. 
I may or may not want to get better at it. If I do, great, let's go engage in a deliberate process to become competent at this area. So that's the conscious competence model. At, and at Fishers, we really want to focus on our core values. Our team, our employees are everything to us, and that great team takes great care of our customers. We do so with open-mindedness and curiosity. We do so with trust, and we always want to get better as a company. So when we're looking at areas that we want to improve, these core values, we come back and say, what area is our weakness? Where can we improve in some of these areas? Move that to conscious incompetence, and then actually work on them and become competent at them. And those core values are everything to us. So those, that's a good, uh, you know, good area to go target and identify areas for people to improve. The second area, the, the, the second tool that we want to talk about is, hey, are you a micromanager? I'll ask team, you know, groups all the time, do you micromanage or are you a hands-off manager? And people usually have an opinion like, no, I just hire great people, I let them do great things. So that's the value in this model for us is to understand our management style and our leadership style really depends on who we're managing and who we're leading and who, who that person is at the time we're trying to lead them. So what we do is we talk about, we can put all of our teammates uh, into these quadrants based on skills and attitude. So on the skills side, uh, highly skilled to the top, low skills for the job function at the bottom, and then their attitude. Do they have a good, positive, hardworking attitude or do they have a bad attitude, right? So high and low here as well. So we can start to categorize and, and, and put our, our teammates into these quadrants. This person up here is highly skilled and has a great, positive attitude hard work ethic. That's our superstar, right? We want lots more of those. This person I call the toxic loser. This is someone who is not skilled at their job function and they don't care and they have a bad attitude. Toxic loser. The destructive performer is highly skilled, great at what they do, but have a bad attitude, right? They're destructive to those around them and probably not performing to their maximum capacity. And then you have the ambitious rookie who is not skilled yet at their job function, but has a great positive uh, attitude and work ethic. So you can probably start to think about your colleagues and putting them into these quadrants. Think about yourself, where do you fall in these quadrants? And so that's us as, as team members, as, as contributors to our organizations. The power of this model suggests that there is a different leadership style depending on who you're leading the destructive performer, the superstar, the ambitious rookie. That management style is characterized by guidance. So this is coaching. This is A, B, C, one, two, three, here's how you do your job. And that this, the uh, scales here are flipped, low to high, low is on the top. And then engagement. This is the amount of time we actually engage with the teammate. And that is again, reverse low to high. So how much coaching and guidance do we give somebody and how much time do we spend with them as they do their job function as leaders? Right, so if you look at this toxic loser, if we choose to work on this person with a bad attitude and no skills, uh, the coaching style there is micromanagement. It's the definition of micromanagement. Guidance is high. ABC, one, two, three, here's how you do your job and engagement is high and I'm gonna sit here while you do it. I'm gonna tell you what to do and ride you while you're doing it. That's true micromanagement. And that's what a toxic loser, if you choose to work on them, needs as a toxic loser. You look at your superstar, what do they need? They don't need guidance because they're a superstar, they're highly skilled, and they don't need a lot of engagement because they're highly motivated and enthusiastic about their job to go out and do a great job, right? So that micromanagement is truly hands off. Now, of course, we want to engage with all of our team members and have personal relationships and give them accolades. Uh, but in terms of, from a leadership style, that superstar does not need a lot from you. Uh, the other two are the interesting ones, right? So the ambitious rookie who's not highly skilled um, but has a great positive attitude, what they need is what we call guide and let it ride. Like give them lots of coaching, give them lots of resources to go get their skill set up but they're highly motivated to go out and do a great job. So we don't need to sit there and ride, ride along with them as in high engagement level. We can have lower levels of engagement once we've coached them. The destructive performer who's highly skilled but has a bad attitude, if we choose to work on them, it's constant contact. We don't have to tell them how to do the job. We don't have to work on their skill set. We don't have to give them a lot of coaching, but we need lots of human engagement with them to get them through this period of, 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 of a bad attitude. So constant contact. So depending on who we're leading, we need to have different management styles. And that could be micromanagement, that could be hands-off, that could be constant contact, no coaching, could be guide and let it ride, depending on who we are managing. 
And here's the power of this model for me, is to understand our teammates don't stay in their quadrant. We move, right? We move around, we're dynamic. You could have a superstar who we promote into a new position, all of a sudden their skills are not up to speed with the new job challenges, right? So they move into that ambitious rookie, so the leadership style for their leader needs to be much more coaching and get them, their skills back up. Or attitudes may drop over time, right? Move from right to left because of maybe there's something going on in their personal life. You can't help but bring that into the workplace sometimes and the attitude drops. Well, their leader needs to understand that attitude is dropped and we need to become more engaging as a leader for that person, right? So our leadership style needs to modify according to those who are leading and what they're going through. That's management style. Yes, my, micromanagement is great for the right person. Yes, hands-off leadership is great in the right situation. So moving from leadership style, we'll move into flow. How do we keep our teams in flow? What I mean by flow. So this is the chick sent to me. Yeah, I can't remember how to say that, but this is the flow theory. Um, and what this suggests is, again, our teammates have skills and, they, and this, this lower quadrant is an attitude. This is challenge. So we can have um, employees or to, you know, our teammates that have high levels of challenge, but they don't have the skills to meet those challenges. That, ca that causes anxiety in our teammates. If the challenges outpace their skill set, it causes anxiety. If the challenges don't match their skill sets, so they're below their skill set, they're going to get bored. Right? Neither anxiety nor boredom are good for our teammates. What we need to do is find this area, the right balance of challenges to skills to keep them in the flow zone. Right? And as their skills increase, the challenges need to increase as well, or they're going to get into boredom. So thinking consciously and deliberately about our teammates, how do we keep them in flow with the right level of challenge for the skill set? Keeping the skill sets going up and the challenges going up, keeping them in flow. Now, I, I pointed out that is directly stolen uh, from uh, Csikszentmihalyi, however you say it. Um, and so I want to point out that a lot of these concepts and these tools are not developed uh, at Fisher's. They do come from our R&D department, which is rip off and duplicate, right? So we learn these tools, uh, we gather these tools, we Fisherize them, we make them our own, uh, but don't want to claim that we made these up. They certainly come from other great uh, thought leaders. Moving from flow, I want to talk about personality. What personality should be on display when we're at, in the workplace or anywhere, frankly? What personality should be on display? What's that mean? Well, in business school, I had a leadership professor. Actually, she was not a professor. She was a Broadway director that was, on, that was doing a, taking a, a sabbatical and doing uh, a, a course on leadership. In grad school it was fantastic and all of her concepts all of her leadership concepts came from the theater as an analogy for that leadership and what she said uh, for this particular I got a lot from her this one tool I grabbed was that we all have different characters they're genuine characters they truly are characters but we're probably different with some colleagues than others we're probably different with our parents than we are with our kids we're different in different situations professional situations or personal situations and those are all genuinely us, I hope, they're di but they're different, right? Again, I'm not going to be with my fraternity brothers. I'm not going to be different than I am with my kids. And they're all me. So understanding what are those genuine characteristic characters that we have that we play day in and day out, and then consciously understanding which ones need to be on stage right now. Really important as a leader. This is Fisher's headquartered here in Boise. I use this building as an analogy for me when I applied this tool at Fisher's when I came here 16 years ago. Um, my predecessor was very, very charismatic and engaging with all of our team members. Knew their, their kids and their families and could not walk through the building without asking them what's going on in their lives. And that was awesome. That created a sense of family and, and engagement. Um, I, I possess, as a leader, I possess that same desire and, and interest in our, deep interest in our teammates. At the same time, I also get focused on what I'm doing, right? And I found myself walking through the building on the way to a meeting or wherever I was going, focused on where I was going and I was not engaging with those in the hallways of Fishers on my way. Well, think of those who say, hey, uh, the CEO just walked by, didn't even make eye contact. I'm not even important. They can't even acknowledge me as a, as a teammate. That was the message I was sending when I wasn't engaging with those around me. 
So I have this genuine character of focused and ready to go engage deeply in a meeting. At the same time, that's not the character I can have on stage when I'm walking through the buildings of Fishers. I need to have that engaging, caring about our teammates character, which is genuine. I need to put it on. So I actually put a, a mental trigger on this door from my office and any of the external doors coming into, the, into our building to say, hey, I'm going to put my engaging, employee-loving character, which is genuine to me, on stage right now until I get to my office, till I get to that meeting, and then I'll put on the right character that I need for that meeting. Right? So playing the right character, putting the right character on stage, and keeping those wrong characters off stage. Right? I'm sure my kids swear. I have 13, 16 year old boys. I'm sure they swear. Hope they don't, but I'm sure they do. And I tell them, if you're going to swear, think about what stage you're on when you're swearing. And what it says to, to, to the, the, uh, that audience about your personal character, your personal brand, your family, your core. Right? Put the right character on stage at the right time is this uh, lesson that we're sharing here at Fishers and our leadership team. Finally in this category of just general uh, tools uh, is should we batch up problems? Should we batch up good news? Should we share them all at once? There's some psychology here that uh, I saw the research on and, and I thought it was had a good end leadership message for us about information sharing. So this grid is vertically is amount of pleasure we get out of events, and then the opposite the amount of pain we get out of negative events. Um, the x-axis here is the number of events that are delivered at once, so the number of pleasure uh, data points that are delivered at once, or negative or painful data points delivered at once. So here, here's, the, here's the psychology around it. Uh, if we think about delivering ne bad news, negative events, bad news to somebody, so here's one negative event, and there's the amount of pain that that one negative event delivers to the recipient of the news. Let's say at the same time we delivered two pieces of bad news. Here's two. There's the amount of total pain delivered. And you can see based on the curve, the more negative data points we deliver at once, there's diminishing amount of pain, incremental pain delivered by that news. Right? So this is six pieces of bad news delivered at once and the amount of pain that six, uh, those six delivered at once. Similarly, on the positive news side, you can see I made a green and red. Uh, you get a good, piece of, a good piece of news, right? One at one time. Here's the amount of pleasure we derive as humans from that one good piece of news. Let's say at the same time, we got another good piece of good news. Here's two. I got two good data points for you. There's the total amount of pleasure. Three, four, five, six. Right, so you see the total amount of pleasure derived from six pieces of good news delivered at once, or six positive events happening at once. All right, here's the takeaway message. If you look on the negative side, here's the amount of pain delivered by one negative data point. Here's the amount of pain by six. You can see five additional losses or, or pieces of bad news delivered at the same time only results in twice the pain as one. Similarly, here's one good piece of news. Here's the amount of pleasure from six pieces of good news delivered at once, right? So five additional wins only results in twice the pleasure as the first one. What's the takeaway? Bad news should be batched up and delivered at once. Good news should be spread out over multiple events, right? So looking at the bad news, why do we want to do that? Well, we want to minimize the emotional toll or the pain delivered to the recipient of this bad news. Right? Let's minimize how much emotional drain they have. Now, that doesn't mean we ignore, you know, we don't dig into those six pieces of bad news. We say at Fisher's problems are huge opportunities. We want to make sure we analyze all six pieces of bad news. But when we deliver that information to somebody, it's way more humane to do it at once because the emotional toll is less. But we want to go back and make sure we analyze all six of those because those are opportunities for us to get better as a company. Spreading good news out. We want to maximize the emotional pleasure by delivering that good news, right? I don't know if you had a grandma or if, even if you did do this, I had a grandma that if she was going to give you six gifts for Christmas or your birthday or whatever, if you put all six of those gifts in one box, no wrapping, you just put it in the box, maybe you wrap the one box, you open it up and you're like, oh, gift, 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 six gifts at once. What are we doing? We're delivering that level of pleasure on those six gifts versus if you individually wrap each of those gifts and you open a gift, 
look, we're going to get this much pleasure from the first gift. Now we're moving on to the second gift. We're unwrapping it. Now this is a second event, right? We get that same amount of pleasure again. And the third gift and the fourth gift. So delivered individually, the good news, you get that much benefit out of each good news and you're not having the, the diminishing returns on good news, right? So again, the takeaway message here is bad news batch up for the recipient. Good news, spread it out so they get even more pleasure out of that great news. Those are five random tools, not categorically consistent, and I hope they're useful. Thank you.